Welcome back to Venshon Denshon, my YouTube channel. And it is with incredible excitement that I'm launching a new series. And it's grown in my mind since I first started. I'm going to interview and discuss with people who've been influential to me, not just in my musical life, but in all of my, the different aspects of my life. And I couldn't think of anyone better to start with. And I'm delighted that you've agreed to be here. This is, of course, Dan Mendlow, my teacher and friend. Welcome, Dan. Hello. Hello. And Jeffrey. it's, we're going to, uh, this is my first time doing this kind of thing. So I'm going to, we're going to be improvising a bit. I've got a bit of a plan. I want to really drill down into some of the aspects of Dan's amazing career, then talk a little bit about what it was like for me learning from Dan and playing with Dan, and then we'll see where we go. But first of all, I want to start, Dan, by asking you, in your long career, I think you were 30 years principal trumpet in the Sydney Symphony, and before that you were in the Israel Philharmonic and the Jerusalem Symphony, is that right? Is That's that right. where you went to first? Years, 34 years. 34 years. 34 years in the hot seat in the Sydney <laughs> Symphony. That's right. And before that, Israel Philharmonic, Jerusalem Symphony, and of course, your study in the States and all the playing you did there. If, if I, I'm going to ask you right now, a few of the really memorable concerts that stick out in your mind and why, what was memorable about them? Okay, well, I suppose um, going way, way back, uh, 1976, uh, I was lucky enough to be um, uh, a scholarship holder at uh, Tanglewood at the uh, Berkshire Center for the Arts. And um, we were doing uh, West Side Story that year with um, Bernstein himself conducting. And um, somehow the, uh, the way the chips fell, I got to play lead on that, um, on that piece. And uh, wow, I mean, I'd never experienced that sort of um, uh, contagious musicianship um, before where um, he didn't really have to, um, as far as the uh, technique and craft of conducting, he really didn't have to do anything. He just had to uh, stand up there and um, his face says it all and um, just uh, invited the orchestra to play. And um, there was electricity in the air that night. He um, started the concert with that uh, symphonic dances. And then I remember um, the uh, second half was um, Chike 4. And um, I was also um, sharing first trumpet with um, somebody else. I think it was um, Johnny Carroll or uh, somebody way, way back when. Um, and um, <laughs> the last movement was um, was just the circular conducting like this. It was uh, <laughs> it was uh, great to see. I'll never forget it. And um, the fact that he actually um, um, backstage after West Side Story, he was very, very happy with um, the way things went. He uh, put his arm around me and said, well, well played. And uh, that was uh, that that has always stuck in my memory. Wow. Yeah. I'm, a, of course, a huge Bernstein fan. And I've watched those. Do you know those, um, those tapes of when they did the recording of West Side Story with Jose Carreras? There's a, there are yes. videos of that. I've watched them a few times. And they're, they're recording. There are some videos of him rehearsing with the Schleswig-Holstein Orchestra doing Rite of Spring and a few things. And that must, that must have been amazing. How old were you then? 76? You must have been pretty. I was... Um, I was 21. Wow. So had you finished yeah. at Oberlin by then already? I had just graduated from Oberlin. I graduated in, um, in June, early June. And uh, Tanglewood, of course, is, I think, mid-July to mid-August, something like this. And um, then uh, first, uh, first week of September, I was off to um, Jerusalem to take up my position in the Jerusalem Symphony. Wow. I'm going to abandon uh, my thing about memorable concerts. I want to, I want to dig into that. That so at Tanglewood, I think you told me was Guitarla your teacher there? We who are you learning from yes. at Tanglewood? Well, both uh, Roger Vozan and Guitarla were on hand that summer, and um, although I didn't have any private lessons with Mr. Vozan, I had a very memorable um, coaching um, time with him. We did the uh, Stravinsky Octet, and uh, my dear friend Rick Henley played um, first trumpet, and I played the uh, the cornet part. Um, on this antique um, kefir cornet 
that uh, Rick happened to have with the uh, the mother of pearl, um, beautiful stones on it and everything like that. And um, uh, Vossan, Vossan was amazing. I mean, uh, amazing musician. And um, in, when something wasn't going quite uh, quite the plan, he would just snatch somebody's trumpet out, become the mouthpiece, he would put it in, and and this uh, this beautiful responsive sound would come out. Wow. Uh, yeah. So that was that was an amazing experience to work with him. And um, I did have a, a couple of lessons with Gitala, and I'll never forget the first lesson I had with him. I played um, a couple of uh, Charlier studies for him. He just um, he, he just wanted to um, um, just listen listen to me play and see what uh, what I was doing, what I wasn't doing. And um, he said, you know, if you just think about um, you know, something something with the tongue position and something with the air, and um, uh, think about as you as you're coming down from the higher register and coming into the middle register, sometimes your sound goes a bit dull. And so, just get the back of your tongue up and um, think uh, uh, along those lines. And when I did that, I swear my embouchure changed instantly. It um, I used to play slightly on the red, and the mouthpiece just jumped up. Um, and I thought, all right, let's go with that. And of course, the next day it felt uh, very strange, like I was playing on somebody else's face. But I just uh, stuck with it, and um, the uh, the actual ring of the mouthpiece went physically physically higher. And uh, I kept uh, um, kept what he said in mind, and it really made a huge difference. It was like uh, almost like an instantaneous um, change. Wow, that's remarkable. Yeah. You obviously, yeah. you're obviously a very, very, I mean, you wouldn't have been able to play Burns, the, the West Side Story in Chike 4. You must have already been, you know, and you'd already won the job in Jerusalem. So you weren't, you know, you, you were young, but you already, I mean, you'd already developed as a player, hadn't you? It wasn't yeah, you know, I, I, I suppose um, to that extent. And, yeah. uh, but that was just... Um, that to me was just the icing on the cake. It was um, at that stage, um, it really uh, sort of enlivened the sound a little bit in the middle register. I mean, um, you don't have to work very hard when you're pushing the air to get a live sound in the higher register. But in fact, if I uh, just um, get off topic for a second, that's to me, that's the magic of Herces playing is um, when he plays soft. Um, because it has the same color and the same projection as um, when he plays loud, and it's just it's just an amazing an amazing thing. If you uh, listen to that, um, there's a recording I think I think with uh, Reiner, um, the um, Havanas Mysterious Mountain. There's a beautiful lyric trumpet solo in there toward the end that just gets you teary every time, and the reason. The reason it does is just because of this beautiful soft chord of the sound. Wow, so, I'll, I'll like a it. little bit gone a little bit off topic. Not but, at all, uh, not at all. Because <clears throat> I mean, it's going to be a major theme. I think of our chat is about the sound and your sound. And so, just to go back a tiny bit. So before you went to Tanglewood, you did was it three years at Oberlin? How long were you there for? Four years. Four, Four years. years. I yeah. Uh, yeah. Was that with? Were you learning from Louis Davidson then, or you? I, my first three years, I was studying with um, a man named Gene Young, who probably not too many people would have heard of. <clears throat> but that was um, a very, uh, a very fortunate time because Gene had studied with William Vacchiano. Right. And William Vacchiano, of course, was a disciple of um, Schlossberg. Max Absolutely. Schlossberg. So I got um, the Schlossberg training basically from the um the horse's mouth you know and um the difficulty with that schlossberg book is of course number one uh, max schlossberg never wrote it um yeah. that book was uh compiled by his son-in-law a man named harry freestadt and um he uh, managed to um grab all of the exercises that schlossberg had um collected um, that he had collected from schlossberg students and um, if you can, if you look at the book, it kind of jumps from here to there to everywhere. And it doesn't really make a lot of um, sense um, in the structure. 
And I think um, what is lacking is the backbone, is the direction of what do you do? Why are you doing these exercises and how do you do them? What should you be thinking when you do these things? And it makes a night and day, as you know, it makes a night and day difference. Uh, I do know uh, because that was what you, that was what, you know, when I started learning from you, my Schlossberg book was, you know, there were markings all over about different pauses and different how, I mean, we didn't play hardly any of the exercises as they were written. They were exactly. all like, I can even think of, I can think of now, I'm not going to start seeing them, but I can really think of <laughs> where the pauses were, where the energy pauses were, all of those kinds of things. Well, that's right. You, and you, you got that from Bakiana, uh, who got it from Schlossberg himself. Exactly. The, um, the edict, um, air controls, lips react. And exactly. um, you, know, you do do the work before you expect the result. So, and did they uh, used to talk to you about intake? Because I remember when I was learning from you, if I think of one thing, when I think of, of course, I think of sound, but I think of you talking all the time about intake. Well, they didn't really, I mean, Gene never really talked too much about breathing, about the physicality of breathing. That was something that I, um, when I um, basically got here in Sydney, and um, I said, okay, how can I um, take this a little bit further? And I mean, the main reason I took up the trumpet um, way, way back when I was a 10 year old kid is because I had um, a bad case of asthma. And um, so breathing has always been something that, um, I mean, breathing well is something I've never taken for granted. So I've done a little, little thinking about it. And well, he, he did um, go on to say, well, the um, what I used to write in people's books about the upper part of the body being more passive and the lower part of the body being more active. I mean, I still I still stand by that. I mean, everybody has um, different um, concepts of breathing that work for them, and that's absolutely fine. I mean, this has always um, worked for me in that it um, uses the um, the stronger muscles of your body to do the work and keeps this and this and this as relaxed as possible. So that um, it keeps the tension away from your face and away from your torso. Which makes Which perfect sense. And really, yeah, it really makes sense. So, so that was, yeah, sorry, go. That, that was all um, a sort of an offshoot of the Schlossberg. I mean, doing the Schlossberg with, um, with this idea of um, this, uh, this type of, uh, this type of breathing. I used to, um, you know, get people to you know, you know hold their shoulders down or just sort of drape their shoulders so there was no no tension there and um, and uh, just uh, take a natural breath. I mean the um, I think there's an overuse of the word diaphragm in breathing because a lot of people um, don't realize that the diaphragm is actually an involuntary muscle. It's the muscles around the diaphragm that we need to be concerned about about the diaphragm is sort of the team leader. It sort of unites and gets the muscles working in harmony. Um, so this is, um, this is kind of what, what I think about. And I also use a lot of um, sporting analogies when, um, when I teach. Sporting analogies and um, funnily enough, string player analogies. You know, the string players will have a laugh, but uh, because with uh, trumpet playing, so much of it is um, internal. I mean, you cannot see um, kinetically what's going on, but when you watch a string player, I mean, the bow is either on the string or it's off the string. You can see that and you can hear the result of the difference. And um, you can see when a, a tennis player is standing at the baseline and is going to um, take a, a good forehand, um, a good forehand swipe at the ball, I mean, that tennis player to develop the strength and control is going to pull the racket back. I mean, you don't expect to have the strength and control if you don't pull the racket back first. And um, any, any avid golfer will tell you that uh, the backswing in golf is, um, is just as important as hitting the ball. So it's all, it's all about the preparation. And to take that um, one step further with... Um, with our playing, with what we do. Uh, I'm talking too much now, but um, 
Uh, this is exactly what I want. This is this, this is the goal that I think I definitely <laughs> want to hear, and I'm sure that people really want to know this, Dan. So you're not keep going, please. Okay. Well, to take that one step further, um, how can you incorporate this physicality, but do it in a musical way? So I always I always tell my students, your intake, your breath, you have to make that part of the phrase. It's your upbeat. It's your preparation. It's as if a conductor is sitting on your shoulder and going, and it sets you up. Now, whether whether it sets you up the beat before, or if you plan to do two beats before, um, I'll give you a little bit of example of that. This is this is just me. I mean, other people might um, hear this and and laugh. Dad, I'm going to tell they, you, my students, people that I've taught, they're going to hear that. All oh, right. All those times when Jeff used to tell us to breathe in time and all those times he time. just got it from his teacher. From it. They're going to know all my secrets. When if I interview all of my mm. teachers, they're going to realize that where I got it all from. Exactly. I'm with you 100%. Uh, well, there's a very famous orchestral passage that every first trumpet knows and loves. And it involves um, a 3-2 bar with the flutes playing <laughs> and one and two and three and one. Okay. I, think I know it. <laughs> so it's using it's using two beats as your. I mean, because you have to really get a pretty good, a pretty good sort of um, base of air for that one. So I I just don't wait until I just don't wait until the one beat for that. But I breathe rhythmically. Bang. And if you if you sort of pre pre program yourself. To do something like that and it uh it makes it a little bit more predictable i mean that passage is never predictable but um it just makes it a little bit more so fantastic so what i want to do now i want to i want to go to jerusalem so first of all how did you happen okay had you done the audition in the states or how did you get the gig how did that work okay well that's an interesting story in um, my final year at oberlin my senior year um I was actually one of these cheeky buggers that did my senior recital in the first semester um, just to get it out of the way so I could concentrate on um, orchestral excerpts and auditions in the second semester. And what happened was um, I was I was home visiting my parents in Pittsburgh and um, the phone rings and it was Louis Davidson himself. And he said, look, um, um, I mean, we we had. Um, we were getting along very well. I mean, I was, I felt like I was, he was almost a father figure to me. He was, he was great. Um, I have uh, very, very fond memories of his teaching. <laughs> One of the memories I have is that he used to wear a watch on each hand. So you can always keep track of the time. I guess if you have to do, um, if you have to teach six students in an afternoon, this is what you have to do. But uh, um, I always found that a bit peculiar. Never asked him about it, but um, he, um, he phoned and said, now listen, um, I hear there's a, a principal trumpet um, opening in the Jerusalem Symphony in Israel. How do you feel about traveling overseas? And um, you know, an adventure, something like that. And then he spent the next five minutes telling me I was a schmuck and there was no way I was ready. But he said, look, just record some excerpts, um, send the tape and we'll see what happens if you, if you want to. Um, and I, I said, well, I'll record some excerpts, but I'll also, I had just done my senior recital. It had gone quite well. Um, I, I'll send a copy of that as well. What was, and what did you play? Oh, it was a, a piece that, um, oh goodness. I can't remember the name of it. Um, I started off with a badinage and, um, then, um, I think it was the, um, I did a piece by um, a, a double trumpet uh, piccolo um, with, uh, I put together a chamber orchestra. We did uh, a Bonaccini right. um, symphonia. And, uh, oh, Fritz Werner. Fritz Werner, I think it was a sweet concertant or something like that. It's all coming back now. Um, recorded, written for and recorded by Maurice Andre. Right. It's uh, about five or six movements. I think I picked um, the first movement was on piccolo. The second movement I played it on flugelhorn, and the last movement again on piccolo. I sort of went one, three, and five, okay, and 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 left a couple of the movements because 
I did, would have gone over time otherwise. And then um, uh, the, the I remember the last piece was, I mean, we're, we're going back, what, 50 years now almost, 45 yeah. years. The, uh, the last piece was uh, a piece by uh, Tomei, the fantasy. Oh Tomei. yeah, I remember that, yep. Yeah. And I was, a, I was a, as I said, I was a bit of a cheeky bugger. I came out in um, uh, 1900s uh, period costume with my hair slicked back with a, a tight waistcoat and um, playing on a cornet. Nice. Sort of like uh, the, uh, um, the old sort of as, as they would have uh, um, done, you know, in the 1920s and 30s, I suppose. Okay, uh, so, you've, so you, you, you made this recording of these excerpts. I made, you I made a recital recording of some excerpts. I'm sorry. So you made the recording uh, and you sent that with your with your recital, or how did that with work? the recital with the recital tape? And uh, lo and behold, I didn't hear anything for um, a few weeks. But then um, they offered me the job. I got a wow. I got a phone call from um, it was a, a the personnel manager of the uh, Jerusalem Symphony was uh, back then was a guy named Yehuda Fickler. I don't even know if he's uh, still with us, but um, he phoned me and said, well, we'd like you to start in September. And I said, well, that, that's fantastic. I was bowled over. I mean, this is, this is principal trumpet. And um, it, was, it, was going to be, uh, it was going to be a learning curve for me. And um, I uh, was very, very excited about it. Now, Tanglewood came in at exactly the perfect time because um, it was... Uh, just between finishing Oberlin and um, and leaving um, for this uh, for this job in Israel, and um, I I started to um, my teacher Jean Young before Louis started pushing me into playing a lot of excerpts on the D trumpet. Now I don't know if you remember, but when I arrived in um, Sydney, I was playing most of the stuff on this large board D that I had basically put together. And there's a, there's a funny story about that because I had this, it was one of those long bill D trumpets that um, I had with me. And um, when I was at Tanglewood, I thought, well, everybody there was playing on a 238 bill back then. And uh, so what if I got hold of a 238 bill and tried it on this D trumpet? Because the D trumpet had a 239 bill, which is a, a very different story, as you know. Yep. Um, so I, um, there was a guy who um, was the, uh, the foremost uh, brass repairman and technician in Boston um, in those days named uh, Bill Tottle, William Tottle. All who, right. Um, was very, very close friends with um, Mr. Catala. And um, he actually had 238 bells in stock. So I phoned him and, and said, um, I would really love to get a 238 bell put on, on this, this trumpet. Can you do that? He said, well, sure, just you know, bring it in. And so I got somebody, I can't remember who drove me into Boston, but I, I went to Boston, left in my horn. He uh, put, this, put this bell on. And um, now he said, um, uh, I can I I can give you I had a one of my parents checks back in those days so I can give you a check for this, and uh, he said, "Well, I don't know you." Um, I said, "Well, look, um, I can um, I can tell you that I'm a Tanglewood and I'm studying with um, Mr. Gatala." So he actually picked up the phone, <laughs> and Gatala, of course, was in the middle of teaching a lesson somewhere back at back in Tanglewood, and. Um, I never heard the end of that story because I think it was a, a, one of my one of my friends from the orchestra taking a lesson from him, and um, he uh, picked up the phone. And it's, it's it's Bill Tuttle, Bill Tuttle on the phone, um, and uh, he was very 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 bemused that Tuttle was ringing to see if I was an actual person, <laughs> you know, that can be trusted. So um, I, I I copped a bit of flack from that from both Katala and this student who happened to be in his lesson at the time. But um, that, um, that trumpet um, transformed and it became um, uh, a trumpet that you wouldn't have been able to pick from a large bore C trumpet at uh, that stage. Right. So when I, when I arrived in, to make a, <clears throat> a long story even longer, um, when I arrived in Sydney, I was playing 
on that trumpet exclusively? I think that by the time I, because I, I didn't start learning from you till 85 or 86. So I think by then you were already playing everything on C trumpet. Yeah, when I first, because you, because when, when did you, when did you join SSO? Was it in the 77 or 78 or something? 78. Yeah, yeah 78. So I want to, I want to hear a bit about Jerusalem and Israel before we get to Sydney. So what was it okay. like when you got to sure. Jerusalem? What was, what were you doing there? What sort of repertoire? Okay. Well, Jerusalem was, was an amazing experience. I can remember um, the um, the fellow who um, joined the orchestra on the same day with me was my uh, associate principal and third trumpet, a fellow named Rick Berlin. He is still in Jerusalem. I think he's, um, he's well, he was nine years older than I was. Um, well, I guess he still is nine years older than I am, but um, he still lives there. He still teaches um, trumpet casually and, um, that sort of thing. But having met him and um, the first week I can remember was um, the uh, Bach third suite. Right. And um, that was um, with um, a fellow named um, Sidney Hearth. Sidney Hearth was a, um, a concert master in the LA Phil who actually did a bit of conducting in his spare time. And um, he had this connection with Jerusalem. He was a, the actual music director. He was conducting the concert, and we did that. And um, the second week was uh, Bartok Concerto for Orchestra. Right. Uh, so it was uh, definitely a, a very steep, steep learning curve. And yeah, I, I bet. And, the, uh, and how did you come to the go from? Sorry. Year. Say again. I got to, I got to do the Haydn Concerto with the orchestra that year as well, which was which was a lot of fun. And how did you get to go from Jerusalem to Israel Phil? What was the, how did that come about? Okay. Well, there was a, uh, one of the section players in the um, Israel Phil, while, while I was playing in Jerusalem, one of the section players, unfortunately, uh, passed away. Uh-huh. And um, so they had a, um, an opening in the Israel Phil, in the, in the section. And um, I thought, well, I'm here, I should... I should audition for it. I mean, it's great being principal in Jerusalem, but I thought, well, I'm still a, a pretty uh, um, young guy and just kind of starting out, but it would be great uh, from a musical point of view because the Israel Philharmonic um, gets all the uh, amazing soloists and all the all the world-class conductors. I mean, the Jerusalem Orchestra was great, but it was um, uh, definitely a second fiddle orchestra compared to the Israel Philharmonic. And um, so they had a, an audition in Tel Aviv, and I um, I went over, went along, and um, went on stage and played a, a few excerpts for. Um, I mean, Zuba Meta was there, and um, the um, the brass, a few of the principals in the brass section, and um, did you know the usual the usual excerpts, the Mahler fives and uh, Leonor and um, I think uh, Pines of Rome that sort of thing, and um, played a bit of the Haydn for them. And um, I was, um, they said, well, thank you very much. We'll be in touch. And I thought, oh, okay, well, great. They had, I think they had about seven auditioning on that day. Um, I was packing up my stuff, you know, behind the stage and um, I turned around and they were all approaching me. And um, uh, they said, well, um, this is Zubin Mehta himself said, well, I want to ask you a question. He said, you're, you're principal trumpet in the Jerusalem Symphony. Why do you want to, why are you auditioning for us? I said, well, I said something really quite uh, funny at that point. I said, well, a lot of people look at the fact that it's better to be the, uh, what did I say, the, uh, the tail of a lion rather than the head of a lamb. <laughs> I guess they like that. <laughs> um, I, I, I didn't think of that myself. Somebody else had actually mentioned that and said, well, you know, you're going and you'll, um, if this is the case, this is what will happen. Um, so they said, well, look, um, we want you to make up your mind about this slowly and um, uh, to be sure. So we're leaving um, next week, we're leaving on a tour. Um, that is going to start in a, uh, a little village um, a few hours from uh, Vienna um, with some recordings. 
that sort of thing. And then we're, um, it's a, it's a six week um, all European tour. Um, come with us as a member of the orchestra and um, you can make up your mind. So this is, this is, gets me into these funny stories because um, I said, okay, I'll do that because it was, it was summer vacation then. And in the Northern hemisphere, I mean, the orchestras stop in May, June, and then you have, it's just like the school year. So um, we uh, headed off and that was a funny story. I had my, um, my quad trumpet case and, a, and another big suitcase. And they said, well, you get on this train from um, Vienna, it takes you to a town called Villach, which um, is like a, um, a spa type town where people go to rest and recuperate. This is, this is where the recordings are going to be. So I um, walk into the first day of recording session, but before that I arrived and uh, they said, well, who are you? And I said, um, well, I've come to join the orchestra. You, you've invited me to join the orchestra. They said, what orchestra? What are you, what are you doing here? I said, there's no orchestra here. And they were, this is, they were just sort of, um, they were doing the Israel Philharmonic security thing. They, they wanted to, I, I, thought, I thought they were gonna, I thought they were gonna take me inside a room and, and, uh, and strip search me and uh, that sort of thing. They had to be, they had to be really um, careful I mean, they, they knew who I was, but they were trying to really sort of uh, make sure that, that I was who I said I was, if that makes any sense. Yeah, of course so, it does, because I'm thinking finally, in, the context of, in the context of the Munich Olympics, for example, that, oh, yeah. that whole kind exactly. of that, that scenario. It was only a few years after that. Yeah, so, exactly. Um, yeah. So finally, they finally um, accepted that I was joining the orchestra. I walked in for the first recording. And um, brings me to an, another memorable occasion. It was um, uh, on the podium was uh, Leonard Bernstein and we were recording his symphonies. Wow. Um, he, I think it's uh, four symphonies that he wrote. And I think um, that morning they were recording the Cutter Symphony and um, Bernstein looked back and said, you, how are you? <laughs> nice. Well, it was, it was fantastic. So um, he remembered, obviously, from Tanglewood, which was only uh, you know, a year or so, a year and a bit ago. Um, so I joined the orchestra. I decided um, when we were in Berlin, um, they were playing playing concert at the Philharmonia. I thought, well, this is this is for me. I mean, this is this is this is great. Lovely to be part of the orchestra. Um, I was playing um, third and fourth trumpet, which you know for me at the time, and second with two trumpet programs, which for me at the time was I thought very very valuable. I mean, just uh, this is how you learn. I mean, you keep your mouth shut and your ears open, um, and um, all these uh, different concerts and um, that sort of thing. There was a um, uh, a cruise ship. Um, uh, they had a, um, a Greek um, liner that uh, the orchestra was um, guest, uh, sort of guest aboard. And this, this ship would cruise from one point to another throughout Scandinavia um, and um, play um, concerts in all the various ports. There was Malmo and Aarhus and Copenhagen, Stockholm, Oslo, and um, then they get back on the ship and sail, sail to the next port. So that was that was great fun. But I wrote my letter, my letter, letter of resignation to um, Jerusalem from the hotel room in, in Berlin, saying, "Well, um, and this was I think I was giving them plenty of time. I think it was still sometime in July. Um, the the uh, Jerusalem orchestra didn't start until September. Um, now." Remember, this was before the days of emails and, um, of and that sort of thing. Um, so this letter arrived back in Jerusalem and sat on Yuda Fickler's desk for weeks because he just didn't come into work uh, to open his mail. So he gets this letter and opens it two days before the season's about to start huh. in September. Um, so the orchestra 
was, I mean, the Jerusalem Orchestra was not, um, not impressed. I'll bet. Um, but I, I felt I had done the right thing. I didn't, I didn't, uh, it wasn't my fault that he just didn't look at the letter. Um, so um, that was, there was a bit of toing and froing there. And finally, we had Swanee, an old schoolmate of mine, came over and took my place in, um, in Jerusalem, a guy that I knew from Oberlin, uh, another trumpet player named uh, Charles Lorette. Right. Who um, just retired from the Pittsburgh Symphony now. Um, but he um, he actually came over to Jerusalem, which was uh, great because there was another another familiar face there of while course. I was uh, living in Tel Aviv. So how long did when? So I know that you did your audition for Sydney while you're on tour. I think didn't you? You played some excerpts. How did how did you get from Israel to Sydney? Because that's not okay. That's not well, a clear connection. How did that happen? Well, it's an interesting question because, um, see, what they didn't tell me in Jerusalem, I mean, maybe I was just too young and too naive, was that um, they said, well, you want to emigrate on this A1 visa um, because this A1 visa means that you're, you're Jewish, aren't you? I said, yeah. I said, well, you, you're able to, instead of just coming over and being a working tourist, you can immigrate and your tax rate will be much lower and you'll be able to sort of buy cars and washing machines and what have you um, tax-free because you're settling in. Not that I was interested in buying cars and washing machines at the age of 21, but um, or had the money. Um, but um, what they didn't tell me was that in three years time, depending being on- Being the army, right? Were, exactly, yes, bingo. So you put down your, your trumpet and you, um, learn how to uh, disassemble and assemble an M16. Now, um, back in those days, it was before the United States um, recognized any sort of dual citizenship. So I would have lost my US citizenship. I would have been inducted into the, um, the front line of the uh, Israeli army. Um, I probably would have ended up playing one of the bands, but not before going to all the basic training and all the basic misery and that sort of thing. Um, and for um, a country that you did not grow up in, I mean, it had no um, real intentions of staying there. I didn't think that would be um, appropriate. So I started looking around and um, I remember the evening, um, one of the um, colleagues of mine showed me an ad in um, what used to be called the International Musician. It was just this before online ads um, it was just a newspaper, a union paper that they would put ads in um, to advertise um, orchestral positions on the back page. And there was a tiny ad that said, Principal Trumpet Sydney Symphony Orchestra. I thought, well, Sydney, it's the Opera House, it's uh, a lot of, far, pretty far away, but um, I'll give it a go and um, see what happens. So I decided I would. Um, I applied for it. Now to apply for it, you had to send a tape of your playing to their offices in New York. Oh. Um, the, uh, back in those days, it was the Australian Broadcasting Commission, not corporation. So it was all a government thing you had to send to their offices in New York. Um, so I, I went in with um, a mate of mine in the orchestra and we again recorded some excerpts. And um, recorded some excerpts. I think I sent them a recording of the Haydn and um, that got sent to got sent to Sydney. Now I didn't hear anything for weeks. So I kind of, to be honest, I kind of forgot about it. And um, in the middle of the night, the phone rings and it's uh, somebody from the uh, commission office in New York saying, well, they want to hear you when you're in Sydney. I also, um, I left that an important part. I told them that I was in the Israel Philharmonic and that we were touring Australia the following spring in uh, 1978. Right. So I said, I would be more than happy to play for you live um, if the tape at all is interesting. Um, so that's what happened. They, um, <laughs> they sent me this, um, this uh, huge booklet of excerpts. I remember I was in Adelaide. Um, this is uh, on the Australian tour with the IPO. And um, this thing arrived and it was like 50 pages of excerpts. And I thought, well, surely I don't want to hear all these. <laughs> and um, 
So I don't fully remember. I, I mean, I was I was doing a, a lot of practice in those days, and um, um, so I, I was just trying to play through all these things. And I mean, you, you can't play through fifty excerpts um, and uh, um, be at all um, sane by the end of it. So I finally got to Sydney, and they and uh, they, we teed up an audition. I was to play at the town hall, and a bunch of the brass section had. Um, uh, stood back at the uh, end of a school's concert, I think it was. And um, Peter Walmsley tells a story. I really don't remember it very well because I know when you, the adrenaline's flowing, you don't remember things like this. But he, he said, um, I stood on stage and I said, well, um, I've got this, uh, this booklet of excerpts. Um, what would you like to hear from, from this? And um, I think Don Hazelwood at the time um, who was on the panel said, well, look, no, we just want you to play a few of what you feel are your strongest excerpts. And um, so he tells me that I took this uh, big packet of excerpts, this big booklet, and just nonchalantly chucked it on the floor and played the audition from memory. Now, I don't remember that at all. Um, but then um, apparently I heard afterwards that they had actually sent uh, delegation to the IPO concerts to uh, to hear me playing in the orchestra. Um, there was one little bit I left out that um, just before we left for Australia, the um, who was playing associate principal trumpet in the IPO at that stage, a, a gentleman named Elon Eshed, um, had some sort of a uh, a funny. He was a little bit of a a little bit of a hot-tempered individual. He had a bit of a disagreement with Meta about something. And he, he just said, well, no, I'm not going on the tour. So um, they approached me to play associate principal on, on the tour, which was a real honor and it was a real, um, it was a real thrill. So I got to play, uh, I think the repertoire back in those days, um, uh, they were doing the Bartok Concerto for Orchestra, which Glenn Fishtal played. I was playing third in that one, but then they were doing, um, we did Beethoven five and we did Brahms one, which I played first in, in both of those. And of course the, the big piece was Mahler five, which uh, Glenn was playing and I was, I was playing third on that one. Um, so I, I did get to do a, a fair bit of uh, first playing on that tour. So that's, um, they heard me as a, as a first trumpet in the orchestra. Um, so I guess they, they were able to make some sort of an educated decision, whether they made the right one, who knows? I think they did make the right one, but I think for people <laughs> that maybe don't know the, the history of the SSO so well, before you were principal trumpet, uh, another very, very fine trumpet player, Gordon Webb was principal. And before Gordon was John Robertson, who's a, a legend of Australian trumpet playing. So you know, That's you right. were you were filling some you were you know you were filling some big shoes. Filling some big from, shoes, definitely. Yeah. So, then did you went? Did you go back to Israel and get your stuff, and then come back to Sydney to start, or how did that? How did it? What, <laughs> tell us about the start of your tenure right. in Sydney. That was a, that was another funny story. They, um, I was supposed to. The plan was, um, I can remember this quite clearly. In May of that year, nineteen seventy eight, they were doing Mahler six, and my big plan was to get to Sydney to play. Mahler six. So we had taken care of all the all the visas and all the paperwork and everything, um, fill out the forms, got the chest x-rays, you know, God knows what have you, and sent this all on a big packet to Sydney. Now this was right after, I don't know if you um you were been fairly young in those days, but um there was a bombing at the Hilton Hotel. It was the first ever terrorist incident in Sydney. Um, I think uh, the Ananda Marga or some group was behind it in 19, uh, I think it was uh, the year before in 75. And so they, the alarm bells were up um, and they got this packet from <laughs> the Middle East. They, um, somehow the powers that be in the ABC thought it was a letter bomb and sent it straight back. Yeah, they... Uh, they didn't, I mean, maybe it was before the days of X-raying x -raying mail, but they sent it straight back. So that held up everything. So this thing came back and I had to do the, everything again. And um, so I ended up getting to Sydney 
in um, July of, well, late June of that year. Um, the first couple of weeks were absolutely insane. I remember um, Hans Paul Decker was um, the uh, guest conductor the week I joined the orchestra. Um, the actual music director at the time was Willem van Otterloo. Exactly. was, um, had uh, actually was on his way um, out and uh, Louis Fremeau was coming in later that season to take his place. Now, um, my first couple of weeks in the, uh, the orchestra, as I used to say to people, um, we started with uh, the Ludoslavsky Concerto for Orchestra. And that was on Wednesday and Thursday night. The following Saturday, Monday and Tuesday was Bruckner 7. Okay. And um, then the uh, following Saturday was what they used to call the Gold Series, which was uh, music that was um, unusual, special that you'd never hear anywhere else. And that was the Alpine Symphony. So I wasn't sure whether I had gone to heaven or hell. Um, uh, so that was a, a very, very steep couple of weeks. Wow. I um, guess the good thing when you start like that is it makes everything, everyone can relax because they know they've got the right person. Well, I, I hope that's the way they felt at the time. Um, and then um, that uh, there was only one shot at the Alpine Symphony on the Saturday. Um, this was all played on that D trumpet, by the way. Right. Um, then... Um, the following week, we started rehearsing for the recordings with uh, Van Otterloo of The Rite of Spring. I used to have that record. That was one of, I, I had that record. You, what did you, you were playing the pick part, I guess, were you? That's right, yeah. And did you play that on your D or did you play that on a pick? Oh, I played that on a pick. I played it on, on an old uh, Soma piccolo that I had. Right. Yeah. Wow. So you moved to yeah. Sydney and if you, I mean, and then began... So 34 years in the hot seat. If you had to, if you had to think about what some of the really memorable concerts in your in your tenure as principal trumpet of the Sydney Symphony. Wow. Okay. Well, I suppose concerts can be uh, memorable in many different ways. They can be <laughs> memorable, uh, memorable emotionally. There, there was one mem one very memorable concert. I want to um, I want to just go back for a second in Tel Aviv. Yep. Um, the very first time I played first trumpet in the Israel Phil was, um, I think, uh, somebody somebody was ill at the last minute, and it was just um, the, the the Liszt piano concerto. I think the Liszt piano concerto number two, uh, not the one in E flat, the the other one. Right. Um, but, um, it has that little solo in the uh, in the last part, da 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 dum, and. Um, I was absolutely berserk terrified um, and um, played the concert. The concert was okay. Um, but then um, they said, well, uh, Mr. Mater would like to see you in his room, in his dressing room afterwards. So um, I went up to see Zubin and um, he said to me, uh, I mean, Maestro Mater, I'm being a bit disrespectful now. He said to me, um, look, um, you play first trumpet, it was it was fine, it was okay. But you did not look at me when I needed you to. You did not uh, make eye contact with me. You, you did not, um, um, there wasn't that two-way sort of street happening. I said, never um, um, let a conductor feel that you're not making eye contact. And from that day on, that stuck with me. And so um, I used to just um, make a point of they practically memorizing the parts and just looking, looking at the conductor. I used to I used to make Ado cringe because he, I was always staring at him. I can tell yeah. you a, a funny story of my own that the one week that I played in the Berlin Phil, I Mater was conducting, and we were playing. Um, I think it was the orchestral pieces by Berg and it has a few little trumpet bits and I knew that he liked eye contact, so I'd memorized them and I stared and I, and I think he liked it. I really looked him, I looked him in the eye while I was playing it. So I, I think someone had told me that, that he liked that. He liked that. So anyway, back, yeah. back to the, so what, what about in Sydney, some of the really memorable concerts that, you know, that stick out now all these years later? 
Uh, okay, well, I think the first time you do anything, um, I had just um, um, heard uh, for the first time in ages, the very first time I played the solo part in Mahler 5 was um, with uh, Charles McCarris conducting. And again, that was, um, that was a very unusual piece because they put that on the gold series as well, way back in, uh, I think that was in 80, uh, must have been in 83 or something like that. So um, I, um, I remember that very well. And I also remember, well, the various, the various conductors that you strike for that piece. I mean, um, Mahler 5 is uh, a very, uh, it's a very special piece for any first trumpet because, you know, it's, it's all about you at the beginning um, in a way, but you try to make it all about Mahler. I mean, you try to really sort of set the mood for the entire the entire symphony really um and it was interesting to me how um various conductors had their own way of achieving this um i remember um when um well ada devart came to sydney his very first concert with us Mahler five and um he uh, was very very happy the very first thing ada um asked me i mean we we played the rehearsal in the morning. Um, he was in the green room. He said, look, you don't play a Monet trumpet, do you? <laughs> <laughs> no, sir. And um, you know, so we were, we were best buddies from that point on um, because I think he had had enough of, um, enough of those particular instruments where he, where he was before, not mentioning any specifics or anything. Of course. Um, but um, then um, Lauren Mazel, um, the orchestra was very, very pumped at uh, Lauren Mazel coming to Sydney. His very first concert with us, Mahler 5. And I remember sitting there, I had just flown in stupidly. I had just flown in from Canberra that morning. Um, sometimes I would do that. I would uh, stay over and teach and then fly and meet an early rehearsal or go in, um, fly directly for the evening concert. Um, and um, he stood up on the podium and looked at me and said, I think you know how it goes. And uh, didn't conduct the beginning at all, just stood there. And um, didn't, uh, didn't pick up his arms until the big, um, um, what is it, an A major chord. Yep. And um, then, then, he, then he conducted, but uh, you know, just sort of, he would just give you the nod and you would start. Um, so these these are all very memorable concerts, and of course um, Stuart Challenger, um, his concert, his his Mahler two, his um, his Brahms four. I mean, these are concerts that um, I mean, um, after we got back from the nineteen eighty eight tour, I mean, you could tell. Um, I mean, Blind Freddie could tell that Stuart was dying. I mean, he was not. Uh, he was not looking well, and uh, he was. Uh, it was really taking a toll physically on him every every single rehearsal, every single concert. So I mean, the orchestra was emotionally charged for that reason as well. I and mean, we we had finally found a conductor who was he was he was starting to become something really special. And I mean, he started out as an opera conductor. Basically, when he started working with the, the Sydney Symphony, all his beats were way up here. And he realized that he didn't have to do that because he wasn't in the pit anymore. So he finally refined his um, conducting man. His, um, he was a very tall man and his, he had a you know 20 foot wingspan. So um, he had to really sort of curb things in. And um, I think um, once he worked that out that he didn't have to work so hard, um, he could concentrate more on the um, on the core of the musicality of the works. So um, I remember the. I think you did Mahler two a few times with him, but I remember the yes. first time in the town hall because I was playing fifth trumpet. And I, if I, if you asked me some of my memorable concerts that I heard you, that Mahler two in the town hall would be right up there. They were. That was. Wow. I, did we do it once or twice? I'm not, I can't remember, but they, they were, very, that was, a, and I can't remember if that was before or after your tour. I'll have a look because I think I've got that tape lurking around somewhere. 
And if I do, I'll digitize it and send it to you. Yeah, because that that was really, that, re- that remained in my head for many, many years after. Dan, if it's okay, I want to pivot now and go to when I first started learning. I want to talk a little bit about Okay. My, when I was learning from you, so uh, I'm going to tell I'm, I'm going to tell a few stories, Dad. You can see whether you whether they're true or not. So, in right. at the end of 1983, when I decided I was going to start playing the trumpet, my dad, Abe Siegel, who was a who knew you and admired you a lot. He, oh, I, I remember he, your dad very well. Of course, yeah. he yeah. took me for my very first trumpet lesson. He took me to you, and so the very first lesson I had at all on the trumpet. Imagine that. That's you know, quite lucky. And I, I came over and I, and I played for you and you said, well, look, yeah, everything. You, I heard your sound and you said, well, I don't have time. You didn't have time to take me on then. And you sent me to someone who, to Paul, who had been your student before. And so I went and learned from Paul and Cliff for a few years. And then I came back and even before I actually started learning from you in 86, you gave me the opportunity when I was still in high school to come and play in the orchestra when we did Tarangalila. And then oh. when I started the con in 87, I had, I learned from you for, a, you know, a couple of years before I went to Europe. And what I remember the most was this opportunity to have a lesson from you. And then the same evening to go into the opera house and hear you play. And I think that combination of hearing you talk about it and demonstrating lessons as well, but then being able to go to the concert hall and actually hear you do it. I think that that was an amazing apprenticeship for me. And then later on to get to play in the orchestra with you. But there's one thing I remember, and I don't know if you remember this, for a little while you were into this chest expander thing. You had this chest expander <laughs> and that you and you try and you show me and you and you got it and you went, right, so you've got to do this. Choom, choom, and, and I got it. And I went. I couldn't, and I couldn't move it along. He said, no, no, it's like this. And then in my mind, then you started going like this and like this, and you probably didn't, but in my mind, I just remember that I couldn't move it at all. And you were just, you're like, no, Jeff, you've got to just breathe in. And you were it, was, it was just that, that big rubber thing. Yeah, it was like yeah, a, it was. A big, a big rubber. Well, the joke was on me because that that thing, I mean, it was that was what it was designed for, but uh, it finally snapped. And when it snapped, it left, it left. I had a wealth there for a week. <laughs> <laughs> so, and what, what I remember from learning from you is we did a lot of, you, I remember you said to me, right, when you come and learn from me, I'll have you transposing around corners. And you used to give me, it seems to me now like dozens of etudes, sucks of etudes and sucks. making me do them in E and in D and transposing and, but what I remember is that it was always, always about the sound and always about the phrase and always about the line. And that served me so well afterwards when I, when I went to Europe. But I think it was that combination of not just learning from you, but then when I was lucky enough to play in the orchestra sitting next to you. I think that was where I... I couldn't say where I learned more, but if I if I think back playing just you know playing fifth trumpet in Mahler two, what does the fifth trumpet do? They you sit there for the first four four movements or five first four movements and don't do anything. So just sitting right. there listening or doing Mahler eight, where I was playing the backstage band or the you know the band right at the back of the or the front of the opera house. That's why that we op- did that at the uh, the Olympic Park, didn't we? The one I did was with Dutois in the in the opera house concert hall when I did oh, Mahler eight okay, in, that's, in that's 88. Like- and I think that that opportunity, and I guess that throughout your all those years in being principal, you gave that opportunity to heaps of people, didn't you? To come and play in the orchestra, learn from you. So I think that apprenticeship would be my, my biggest memory. What, what, well, what, what do you remember about me when I was a student? It'd be nice. <laughs> well, no, I, was, I was going to say that, um, I mean, I've always thought that, um, you know, playing in a section with, with people, it's not just about the notes on the page or the instrument that you're holding. There's got to be some sort of a, um, it's got to be more than that. I mean, I think the four players or the two players in the section, whatever it is, it's got to be greater than the sum of its parts. I mean, there's got to be a rapport and an understanding and um, a willingness to sort of uh, achieve good. You know, 
Um, and um, it always, um, I always felt that, uh, I mean, you know, you have uh, students who um, you really had to sort of reiterate things over and over again. Um, you were certainly were not one of those students. I mean, you were you were absolutely um, switched on, and you were you were like a human sponge. I mean, you were kind of um, whatever whatever I um, happened to say at the time, whether it be true or whether it be not. I mean, you would you would take it on, but you would also. Um, you would also have um, feedback and have um, sort of um, um, opinions as well, which were all actually based on your musical feelings and, and your experiences, which I really, I really welcomed. I mean, um, I had a few students that stick out in memory like that. Well, I'm telling you to play something a certain way. Um, why? Okay. Or, or why should I do it that way? Or um, I feel it, I feel it more more this way and um you know if it was a um a solo piece and a recital then so be it if that's the way you feel it and you can um feel convinced that that's a musical justification then by all means that's the way you do it but um if it's something that uh we're doing in a section for example the uh, the length of articulations in the beginning of Bartok concerto for orchestra or something like that you do it the way the first trumpet does it. Um, just a idiot. I mean, it's a it's a very different section playing. It's a very different sort of thing. And um, I think it's um, you still have to uh, even if you heartily disagree with the way um, the the section principle is playing something, you have to convey positivity in the way you do it. You know, absolutely. Um, I, rem I remember. A memorable time was when we did Mahler one with Bichkov and playing third. Then that was a, that was a, that's a very memorable. Do you remember those concerts? Yes, I remember. Remember, um, uh, Maestro Bichkov. Exactly. And, um, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Uh, he was a very, very intense. Uh, he was a very intense maestro. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Wow, yeah. Dan. I feel. I feel like you've really shared a lot about your art and your teaching and I think that um I think people are going to watch this and they're going to love it is there any would I, I, I want to ask you if you had some I think you've just actually given some really important advice for both a section player and of and someone who's playing first I think if I was to think about what you're saying when you're playing first you have to have you have to have a message and you have to it has to make sense and you and you have to you can't just expect the um, the section to follow you blindly. I mean, you have to have you have to be able to justify it musically, and if you can, then that's great. But if you are playing in the section, then you do have to listen to what the first player has to say. Do you have any? I mean, just words of advice for both, like someone who wants to be a first player and maybe someone who's going to be a section player. Just to finish, well, up, just some some words of advice. Okay. Well, um, the one. Um the one fantastic quote that I can remember through all these years is um, actually from Gene Young, who said to me that when you're when you're playing first or when you're playing in a section, you're sitting on a different part of the chair. And, um, you know, if you think about that, I mean, it's, it's true. I mean, you're you're playing first, you feel like you're you're leading. It's um, with that um, with that privilege comes responsibility and um, you have to um, basically set the sound and uh, set the uh, the musical concept for the section, but it all has to be done um, consistently with a measure of positivity and a measure of respect. I mean, you can't um, you can't make people feel um, um, belittled or threatened or um, or sort of put people off the wrong way by asking them or it, it all comes down to um, how you do it, how, the, how you ask to do it. And, um, and again, the communication. So I think that um, this is um, very, um, very good advice for any, any student, depending on uh, whether they're um, pursuing um, a section position or whether they're um, pursuing a, a lead position or whatever. Um, don't forget to be a human being first. 
you know. I think and, that's um, brilliant advice. Well, it's it's all about it's all about music making. It's all about um, you know how would um, um, how would you if somebody um, if I felt that somebody needed um, uh, some attention or some help, I'd always sort of ask them. Well, let's um, let's just uh, try this together. And it's amazing that um, the minute you do that, the minute you set up some sort of communication with somebody, it takes that um, that barrier away. It takes that pressure off, and you're playing music again instead of um, you know thinking about um, a lot of the um, the sort of not so positive things that sort of float through people's heads when they when they play sometimes and they're under pressure so it's all it's all about this how do you cope with the um the pressure to perform and um and uh, the pressure to sort of be at your your best all the time so um that's uh that's one thing that i've i thought i learned and, and uh retained um and i tried always tried to sort of um I guess you can try it and instill it in your students um, uh, by talking about it, or you can instill it in your students by doing it, you know? Um, and um, this, is, this is something, it's, it's all, it's all um, about music making stemming from, from the human experience, I guess, that to be so uh, metaphysical about it, I guess. Um, but uh, no, I think it's a, I think it's a very, very worthwhile point. You just have to sort of be, be grounded a lot of the time. Um, this is when um, this is when ego sort of um, sometimes gets in the way of what we're trying to achieve, you know. And um, not only talking about orchestral players. I mean, this is uh, a prime thing with conductors as well. Is he, serving, <laughs> is, he is he serving the composer or is he serving himself? You know, that's for and, sure. Um, the uh, you can you can tell in a heartbeat the ones that um, don't have their priorities right, um, and um, I think it's uh, it's the same with uh, same with making music. You're only there. You of course, as a player and as a, a solo player in an orchestra, you want to feel that you can put some sort of individualistic stamp on what you're doing whether it's a sound signature or whether you're playing something in a, in a certain way, a certain element of vibrato somewhere along the line, but it always has to be secondary to the, uh, the wishes of the composer. And then secondary to the enjoyment of the public as well. Okay. So I guess uh, that's, a, that's about it. I think that's, a perfect place to for me to say thank you very very much and oh, um you. yeah i what a what a what a what a ride what a journey i'm i feel very honored and privileged that you've joined me today for my first um interview and well, very very, very grateful to you for yeah for being my teacher and friend all these years thank you very and much we, we've got some duets coming up absolutely <laughs> <laughs> be great